All right, Tom, uh, happy to be talking with you about uh, Agent Force today, kind of been all the 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 rave in, in the Salesforce ecosystem. Uh, for, for anybody that, you know, wasn't at Dreamforce or, um, you know, maybe hasn't been been keeping up with with all the Salesforce marketing around Agent Force, tell us a little bit about, you know, what is Agent Force? Why, why is it important? What, what's new about it? And, um, you know, how, how's it going to make a difference for organizations? Sure. Other than the, the sort of the name, which of course describes exactly what it is, right? Um, agent Force. So uh, the idea is that you know, Agent Force is a platform that allows businesses to build, uh, customize, and deploy AI agents, if you will, that automate sort of tasks and improve customer employees, you know, support. So, for instance, the way that it works is, you know, on the Salesforce platform, uh, you're able to sort of go out and create different prompts prompt templates, which will merge data in from your Salesforce org, uh, sort of ground it, if you will, into that Salesforce, you know, your company's data, and then create uh, generative responses to requests uh, utilizing, you know, the sort of the trust layer that goes out. Uh, you can use a number of different sort of LLMs that are out there. So are you using Salesforce's LLM? The answer is uh, no. Uh, you actually have a chance to pick your LLM from a number of ones that are out there. And if you have created your own LLM, you can use a bring your own model and incorporate that in as well. So it's really powerful. I think uh, the way that I see it, you know, personally um, impacts sort of the Salesforce, you know, ecosystem is that any process that you have today, whether it's across sales or service or field service, et cetera, uh, but kind of becomes fair game, you know, for you to go back and revisit and say, hey, what does this process look like? Um, if it was powered or uh, you had an a you know an agent force agent sort of in the loop, take care of a lot of the generalizations uh, or summarizations of like many records, um, as well as uh, provide guidance and even take action on uh, different requests, et cetera. It's quite powerful. I think it's fundamental to the platform. I think uh, everybody's going to need to become familiar with it uh, one way or another. And I think uh, the people who are going to be successful are the ones who do it sooner rather than later. Yeah, it makes sense. I, I definitely want to dive in on the the, the sort of process aspect of, of kind of agents and, and where we see that kind of playing a key role. But, you know, chatbots have you know kind of been around for a long time, right? I think that everyone's probably interacted with a chatbot on a website. What's the big difference between sort of a chatbot that that maybe we're used to using and, and something like, you know, agent for us? Like, what, what's the difference? Sure. I would say everybody's become frustrated with a chatbot at some point on a website, right? I, I certainly have. I had the encounter yesterday with uh, on an airline's website, which uh, will be uh, remain uh, unnamed here. But the difference really is that, you know, with a chatbot, you're building these trees and you're building, you know, sort of predefined questions and then, you know, responses to those questions. And then inevitably you reach the end of what the chatbot can actually do. And it's great for taking care of, you know, frequent requests that might otherwise come into a contact center that you can offload to a chatbot and customers can sort of self-service often take care of, you know, issues, ask questions, get answers, those sorts of things. But when it comes to anything that's really sophisticated or complex, it's obviously you have to, you know, it, route that over to a human and then, you know, the um, the chat either continues with a human or, you know, you, you know, of course, meet the customer where they are via a different channel if it turns into a phone call, et cetera. I think the uh, what what is happening with, you know, agent force is that's different than a chat bot is that you're using natural language. Um, that natural language, it's literally a conversation. You're not sort of selecting from sort of predefined trees. And, you know, what it does is it opens up the it opens up the doors to have a more natural style conversation and then um, which is a better user experience, you know, overall. And then also, you know, the you know, agent force can take actions, you know, on those requests as they come through. And the interesting thing is there's a planner engine that's there. So it can take multiple actions against maybe sometimes single requests, something you don't get in a chat bot. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense. I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it, it, I don't even want to call it chatbots, you know, 2.0. I think it's, it's much more than that. Right. And, and I think um, just the, the sort of flexibility and ability to kind of handle, you know, just a wide range of interactions with folks, I think is a big, big differentiator than, than what we're used to and probably, you know, hopefully a better user experience, right. Than, uh, than maybe you had with that airline. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think, uh, I think the whole thing around, you know, when it comes to the AI really is when we talk about that user experience, the context, you know, like the, the chatbot, the agents, you know, the, the actual AI's context, being able to maintain the context of that conversation. The context is the experience, right? If you think about it, even before we get to, you know, utilizing 
um, or, or, you know, you can use sort of that agent, have a conversation on a website, um, reach a point where you need to transition to a human. The human then obviously, or the, you know, the agent, the, the actual customer, you know, contacts and our agent um, gets a summarization of all of what the previous conversation was, you know, happening within that chat conversation um, and is able to sort of get up speed quickly and then, you know, continue the conversation with, with little or no impedance from trying to go back and read and interpret, you know, everything that happened prior to it. It's, it's really powerful, right? And so I think it truly is the fact that the agent force, the agents that you're actually chatting with, you know, on a website, it during the conversation is maintaining the context of the conversation. And then the context of that conversation is maintained even once it's transferred to, you know, to a human. So in that regard, Regard, I think it's the context is is the experience, um, if that makes sense. Yeah, makes sense. You know, the, it seems like there, you know, there's definitely some low hanging fruit use cases, right? I think we we hear a lot about you know kind of the impacts of you know kind of agentic AI with you know kind of customer service use cases and sales use cases. But um, as you were alluding to a little bit earlier, I think that there's a lot much larger impact sort of possible for organizations kind of under the layer, you know, or a deeper layer than that when you start kind of thinking through, you know, business processes and where can you sort of, you know, really rethink those, refactor those and, and introduce agents, um, you know, kind of into that workflow. You, where how, how should organizations kind of think about, you know, how to get started with that, right? As far as like, where does it make sense, right? To have a really impactful um, injection of, of agents into those workflows. Sure, sure. I think it's several things, right? Like, but it's just the really two that really come to to, to mind um, is clearly you have Copilot, right? Which is you turn that turn it on, you get an icon inside of your inside the Salesforce itself, little Einstein icon. You click on it, and then you can actually have a conversation, you know, um, that's that's happening there. So the Copilot component of Agent Force, I think, is super powerful. Uh, again, it's you're asking questions, it's performing queries against your own, you know, your own data. It's using, um, you know, LLM, you know, outside of the organization to help create those responses. Uh, you're creating record summaries. You're performing queries, like all of those things. So if I open up Copilot and I'm a sales uh, sales rep, I can, you know, hey, what is the sum total of my pipeline in any, you know, in a given in a given stage? You know, it will parse through, pr- process that request, and then bring it back. Um, and, and, you know, it's accurate and it's actionable. Those It's produced to you in a format that has links that if you'd like, you can drill into those records, look at those opportunities, um, maybe even get record summaries off of those opportunities as well. And so the idea then is with that, you might start a conversation in Copilot, but you may end up sort of in the details of, of an actual record and or records inside of Salesforce. In the past, you would have had to have gone through, performed that search, gone to an opportunities tab, clicked on the right list, or performed the search, looked through it, drilled into it, and then read the entire screen. I, I think it'll they will get to a point in time, maybe in a not too distant future, where the first thing you're doing is you're not looking at fields on the screen; you're looking at a record summary first of all of those things. And then, if you want more different, more information, then you start to you know delve into you know sort of those fields you know that are there. So. Uh, Copilot inside of Salesforce, certainly using it inside of that sales channel, I think is pretty, pretty important. Um, the other thing that I think comes into play uh, for the sales side um, is going to be like a sales coach. So there's a sales coach agent where, you know, you can actually practice your sales pitch or handling objections, you know, um, sort of and sort of negotiate, negotiating with you know, some realistic sort of role based you know, um, you know, agents, you know, acting on behalf or acting in those particular roles, getting a chance to do that. If you're someone who's sort of a, um, I don't want to say a young sales professional, but maybe an early career sales professional, having the advantage of being able to have a conversation that you plan on discussing with a client at some point and, and maybe simulating it ahead of time hasn't existed before. You know, you'd have to go hunt down a, you'd have to go hunt down a, a willing participant. Um, and then, you know, depending on who that participant is, th- th- you may or may not get what you need out of that session. So those are just two quick things. There's others in sales um, as well around like creating quickly drafting emails um, based on e- based on data that's specific to that particular client, just real-time savers there. 
Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that I, that, that I'm pretty excited about, um, it, you know, the dynamic canvas capability that, that Salesforce, I think is in pilot right now in the app exchange and, you know, kind of getting you out of the, the sort of, you know, traditional kind of record page, like, Hey, I'm on this account, like summarize what's happening here, but yeah, you know, help me prepare for this meeting. Right. And, and that dynamic canvas starts pulling, you know, information from across your Salesforce org, whether it's cases, account information, um, all into kind of a new UI, which is, which is pretty interesting. Um, so yeah, super excited. I think that's, you know, the, the first time I've sort of seen, you know, Salesforce kind of like, Hey, let's move beyond, you know, maybe what that experience has been with, you know, with Copilot as we're sort of thinking about, you know, agents in a broader, you know, kind of perspective on the platform. So, um, super yeah. excited. Yeah, for sure. I'm curious. What are what are some of the things I know you've you've asked me? I'm kind of curious your insights on some of the stuff too, because we both looked at it, right? We've both been through it. Um, about a, about anything that has been published that you can go through, we've gone through, um, and we've taken a look at it. And the uh, uh, those are some of the things on the sales side. I'm just kind of curious about, but you know, sort of a fireside chat. What do you think? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that a lot of the, you know, a lot of the use cases that that we've sort of talked about or thought about, you know, the, like summarization is really key, right? And I think that those are some of those like low hanging fruit, like hey, help me summarize what's happening. I, obviously, the the amount of information that that people have today at their fingertips is is probably more than ever, but our ability to kind of you know, leverage that effectively is, is probably, uh, you know, not as, not as uh, strong as it, as it has been with, um, you know, kind of less information. It's just kind of all over the place. And so summarization is key. I think that, um, you know, that that'll be sort of, there'll be a lot of compelling use cases there, but I, I do think that, you know, as we sort of dive deeper and, and sort of think about, you know, how do we, you know, take the aspects of the Salesforce platform that are really great, right. Our ability to kind of automate workflows, you know, and not just sort of, you know, have a, a conversational experience, but really allow those agents to kind of go out and do things for us, right? It's not just sort of, hey, go get me this information and consolidate it into a few lines, um, but go and do something, right? Whether that's acting on your behalf in kind of an SDR role or calling out to other systems. Um, and so for me, what, what's really compelling is that I think you sort of start to see a, a need for a skill set in organizations that, you know, folks who can kind of understand, you know, wh where's all of your enterprise data come from? What does it mean, right? How is it sourced? How is it transformed? Um, you know, how do I leverage that, um, you know, using automation tools like Flow kind of in the platform and then building the the sort of prompts and things kind of in, in Salesforce that kind of get you what you need to do. It's, a, it, you know, in some ways, it's a, it's a blend of a lot of skill sets that, you know, probably exist in different roles or in, in, in different folks' heads today um, that I think is really going to force people to kind of, you know, think about the, the work that they do in Salesforce um, in a different way. So um, to me, it's, uh, you know, the, the sort of nature of Salesforce work, I think is going to change, right, in the next two or three years and, and kind of what does that mean and, and how do we keep up with it? Yeah, yeah, for, for sure. Yeah, it's it's fascinating um, just how much, the, you know, the potential that's here for agent force and to sort of have these generative AI components inside of Salesforce and then you marry it to flow and Apex um, so that you can take action, you know, on those things. Clearly, you keep a human in the loop. Right, like that's one of the sort of the safety the the safety uh, items that are there to make sure that whatever is being generated generated before it goes to a a customer that you've got human eyes on it before it goes out. But the actual just generation, just the efficiency that's there of generating, you know, um, um, responses, emails, texts um, during a chat, you know, having sort of prepared. Um, real-time suggested responses to, um, to to basically click on um, or edit before you send. It's just massive, massive efficiencies and time savings. You know, there. It's. Uh, I think it's. I think it'll be uh, really interesting to see where these these things are going to go. Um, and it's it's kind of the beginning, right? Like if you think about, it, we have a handful of native, you know, actions that come come along. There's use cases that are dreamed up that are there that are specific to different industries, um, et cetera. Um, and it's just coming out now, right? Fast forward a year from now, and you look and you see what do practitioners within industries um, really begin to build. And I think that that's the fascinating part. Like that's the really interesting part for me is to see, you know, there's a lot of potential that's there. If you take potential and you put it into the wild, you know what I mean? And you start to develop some experience from it. Uh, that experience, you know, kind of feeds is a feedback loop. Right. You start to go and you start to get like uh, even better use cases. And uh, so I'd love to see where the heck we're going to be a year or two from now when it comes to this.
Yeah. Yeah. I think, you know, everyone you talk to, I think is either feeling the pressure to like do something with AI or they're interested in AI. But I, I think a lot of organizations maybe feel like, you know, they're not ready that, that maybe their data is not in the right spot. Um, what would you suggest? Like if, if you're, you know, working in an organization and you're like, Hey, let's, let's start doing some stuff with agent force. Um, how do you pick that, that first use case, um, uh, and, and sort of not get sort of, uh, you know, bogged down by, um, you know, some of the concerns, right. Is all of our data in the right spot? Like, you know, how, how do you get started? What, what, what do you think? Yeah, it's interesting because I think in the past when we were doing things like predictive models that would calculate scores and then, you know, kind of give us these insights, et cetera, it required quite a bit of knowledge and really good data and a lot of it in the back in the back end in order to create really good models. And those insights would sort of be surfaced. And then it's a question of, okay, where do we surface them? Do we put it on a dashboard? Do we put it inside of a screen? Uh, preferably sometimes it's better on a screen because that's you know in the flow of where people are doing their work. When we get over to the generative side of AI, there's a much lower you know, um, uh, threshold by which to get started, right? Like you don't need a data scientist. You don't necessarily, if your data is not 100% clean, it's okay, right? Like the cleaner the data, the better. Um, but you know, it's not quite as, um, I would say, challenging or as important. I think that was a real big, that, that was a real big barrier, I think, for a lot of companies to get in on the predictive side. Um, and, and because they just felt like either their data wasn't clean, they didn't have the talent pool within the company, uh, they didn't know how to size or scope or how long is it going to take. And then also they would read and hear statistics like, you know, in something like 60, 70 percent of companies' first models, you know, never make it, you know, to production. When you get to the generative side, you're literally turning it on. You're starting to ask questions and you're starting to get answers. And any human being that has any experience in their field can grade the quality of that response um, and verify it, quite honestly. So the tools are now in, in their hands uh, in order to do those things. Um, and then when you combine the two together, and then you can take actions on those things. And that's when you start to get into that agentic, you know, world that we're talking about is that next evolution of, of AI. So I think the barrier to entry is much lower when it gets to the when it gets to the generative, you know, piece. And where to start, I would say, you know, for me, I would recommend that companies do get an opportunity to go out, um, turn on co-pilot. Uh, Take a subset of your users. I, you know, I don't think I've never been a big fan of just sort of turn something on and then let everybody loose with it. I would find a couple of people, a few people within the company that put their hand up that are interested in it. And then also maybe a couple of people that are maybe um, challengers to it, right? That are maybe reluctant to sort of adopt it so that you've got a broad spectrum of feedback about how this particular tool enhances their work experience. As, a, as opposed to trying to just force it in on them. Um, I think over the years, we've we've all learned that once you force a tool, you know, either in a process or on a user, they'll use it for a particular, for a small period of time, but if they don't perceive or understand the quality they're getting from it, they'll, they'll abandon it over time, so. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it makes sense. I think another, you know, interesting, you know, um, sort of item that, that we're going to start hearing more about, right? It's sort of metadata, right? And and kind of that that data about your data and, and sort of grounding uh, your LLMs and, and sort of helping them understand like what, you know, what are these fields in Salesforce sort of telling me, right? What are they used for? Um, I've seen sort of mixed success, right? With, you know, you know, skipping over, you know, sort of description fields and those things. Um, but that's going to become more important, right? And I think, you know, from a, from just sort of a data readiness for LLM, like you can definitely get started, I think, but to, you know, to really evolve into something that's really powerful, it's going to be, you know, uh, really important, right? As I think we've all, you know, we've all experienced some level, you know, of, of kind of prompting and hallucinations with LLMs that we play with them in our, you know, kind of personal lives. Um, and, and, you know, the, the, the quality of your input, right, definitely sort of uh, determines how, how well the, um, the output is going to sort of meet your needs. So I think that'll uh, be another area yeah. right, that, that organizations are going to have to pay some attention to. Um, it's not, you know, not something you sort of just fix overnight, right? I think it's kind of, you know, have a plan and sort of within the context of that use case, like, you know, we can we can start there, right? We can kind of shrink the world a little bit and like, let's focus on, um, you know, sort of solving a subset of um, of our data challenges and, you know, don't let, don't feel like you've got to have everything perfect, right? Before you kind of get started. Sure, yeah, yeah. I think that's it, right? And let's try, you know, try it out in a place where you actually have, um, you know, data, you've got, you know, users that are interested um, in utilizing this part of their job, 
And even though we've got, you know, agents that are at play and then you've empowered them to take action, you know, I, I think a best practice wouldn't be to empower an agent to take action on anything until you're, until you feel like you are uh, very close to actually, you know, any of the hallucinations that would come out of sort of that conversational AI, that those are, are kept to a minimal, managed, and uh, you keep the human in the loop, right, to make sure that um, it's being... In, the human is always aware of what's about to take place before it actually does. Um, so it's the um, uh, we're just not at a point where you can turn it loose, you know, on its on its own. And uh, th there is sort of this sort of extreme theory that's out there that says, right, like if you have this idea of that you've finished a process, let's say you just polished a process last week and it's beautiful and it's there and it's great. Now, you know, that process, you haven't included any type of AI inside of it you know, maybe that process doesn't need it. Maybe it would benefit from it, but you pull it back down, you take a look at it. And now we're saying, how would this process benefit from putting, you know, an AI agent, agent into the conversation, right? The extreme case of that, which we might see in a few years would be, what if I blow up that process and I make it, you know, AI first and I insert humans where I have gaps. Now we're far away from that, I think. Um, but uh, it certainly is in the back of my mind as to how long does it take before you get to that point and that sort of does raise the hair on the back of my neck around like, well, wait a second. Um, it's an AI first, it's an AI agent first approach. Um, the, a, the agent and humans are still working in context. Who's actually leading the process, you know, though? So we'll evolve, we'll evolve into it. So I, it's the reason why I think this is something that it's, again, again, it's evolutionary, like any new capability inside of an organization. And uh, I'm excited about where the heck it's, it's going to go, but it has to be guided. It just can't, and it has to be guided within an organization. It's not just turn it on and let it go wild. Yeah, makes sense. I, I could probably talk to you all day about this, Tom, yeah. um, but to kind of close this out today, you know, what, uh, you know, what are some ways, you know, obviously we, we work at eGen, what are some ways that a, a, a firm like eGen can kind of help, uh, you know, customers kind of take that first step? What, you know, what, what uniquely kind of positions us to, to sort of be a partner on, on a, a company's agent for us? Sure. Sure. Well, I think a big part of it is that eGen was originally born out of data, right? Like data and analytics. And this was always part of the DNA within the, within the company, data engineering, understanding what it means to have high quality data, clean data. And then how do you build the pipelines in order to move that data from its source to where it, it needs to be in order to be acted upon? Uh, I think also a big thing with eGen is that we're able to produce insights in a variety of ways now. You know, it can either be in a dashboard or we can embed those dashboards into the flow of where people work, which is inside of the core Salesforce apps. Additionally, you know, the predictive, you know, Einstein predictive aspects are certainly at play within the eGen, you know, uh, ecosystem as well. And when you start to combine all of those things together, um, taking that sort of that data first approach, saying this data then becomes, you know, you add organization to it, it becomes knowledge. Taking that knowledge and adding, you know, um, a tool such as analytics or an AI agent on top of it produces insights. And then lastly, to take those insights and now empower those agents in order to take action, it is the next natural evolution, I would say, of the eGen story as well. So I would say we've been there kind of from the beginning um, and we are, you know, excited and, you know, embracing this. Uh, having a strong, you know, having a large number of data cloud certifications and certainly the AI specialist certifications that are out there, that tells you about our uh, our potential, if you will. Um, but I think you really need to look closer and uh, at different companies and say, who literally has experience when it comes to insights derived from data? And we've been there since day one. So I think that's a, that certainly is one of the things that, you know, brought me to eGen and has me continually excited about, you know, where we're headed. Awesome. Awesome. Well, great chatting with you about this, uh, Tom. Thanks. I appreciate it. Like I said, we could, we could probably do this all day. But... For sure. All right. Yeah, for sure. Thank you.